why did you fill my sorrow with the words you borrowed from the only place you've known? Interjection, and why'd you sing hallelujah if it means nothing to you, why'd you sing with me at all? And we might live like never before. Cause when there's nothing to give, how can we ask for more? And we might make love in some sacred place, yeah, and the look on your face is delicate. To quote myself, with a bit of amusing muse, why the feminists worshipping Nietzsche? Without dictum of dictate or ethical concern here, that question ought to concern most folks. To quote the poets on the point, throwing shadows on our eyes, they leave us. There is a book, aside from these and mine, that is worth folks reading to the points of this piece, Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy, subtitled Through the Spirit of Music. From the title and subtitle alone much can be gleaned as to the similarity to what I am doing here. However, rather than be overly obtuse or force the readers to endure Nietzsche's work, though, I confess it is a very good book, worth a read if you enjoy reading, I shall summarize the key points as they relate to this piece here, as well as amateur philosophy's general format, tenor, and perhaps aim. In that work, N makes the argument that Socrates was an ugly man, and that ugliness was transformed into a desire to compete within an arena that wasn't dependent upon beauty, at least, not in the physical sense of ugly and beautiful. To compete in a few senses, for mate selection, loves adorations, and also for that peculiarly Greek disposition towards meritocracy as measure. Being that Socrates was not a particularly athletic man, nor young at the time, nor attractive, he moved the competition to the field of the mind. To that of, in other words, philosophy. But this is not really the entirety of the point of the book, such doesn't really even elucidate the title of the work particularly well. Was that a birth of tragedy? Wherefore is such from music? Socrates was in fact a fairly disliked man, ridiculed in many ways, infamously put on trial for his crimes, those crimes being the aforementioned movement of the competition, in essence. But here then comes the music, for, there was also a competition in Athens for the playwrights, the musicians of their day. These playwrights, musicians, these actors, they lambasted Socrates. The play, The Clouds, is of particular note by N. N goes on to argue, though, that in point of fact Socrates was working with the playwrights who lambasted him. Hence, we get at least a sense of the birth of tragedy, the lambasting of Socrates, and its medium, the playwrights, through the spirit of music. There is of course no record of this. This isn't a historical fact, it is a philosophical musing, but also a musing on the point of philosophy. Relevantly though, it is a kind of history of ideas. A history that is not easily noted via what folks might normally refer to as historical facts. They are the kinds of histories that denote how ideas themselves move, create, generate, degenerate, procreate, etc. That kind of tragic movement through the lambasting of the highest is something to be found in a variety of faiths, belief systems, and philosophical interpretations. Such is also fairly easily seen within the notion of meritocracy. Partly such was N's point in making this argument, e.g. that philosophy is doing something strikingly similar to what these other kinds of traditions are doing, though there are some notable differences therein. N's other work, which oft goes along with the birth of tragedy, is Contra Wagner. N had a falling out with his good friend Wagner over an opera. 
the parallels ought to be striking to people. That a philosopher would be so concerned over an opera is also rather telling. Music moves people, after all, and there has long been an interplay between the philosophical musings and the musical movements of an age. For my part, I confess I am not aiming for such a repetition. Absinthe. The way from sin. Contra meritocracy, considerations of meritocracy in general, specifics as regards the notion of meritocracy in relation to performance, value, and economics. Readers ought to utilize the following outline as a thinking tool. These are many of the key points in the piece, here summarized but not really argued for, save for one. Moneyless free labor societies can be understood by applying the points in the summary to the everyday lives of people, the actual state of things, to get a sense of the reality of the absurdities in life, the problems thereof and hence a sense of the motivation towards handling them, as well as a sense of where moneyless free labor societies is coming from. The peace as a whole is broadly removing the tool of money and radically reducing the role of politics, and noting what is present within the species systems with these kinds of concerns in mind. Folks would also do well to, with caution and not panic, Note the recent real-world experiment of a similar kind of occurrence that was the pandemic of 2020, whereby much of the utter absurdities, issues, etc., in the current were exposed relative to the naked reality caused by, in essence, a kind of existential dread. 1. Good enough solutions are reached. Among the fundamental arguments for a meritocracy are that it will tend to produce better outcomes within a given state. This regardless of the state we are concerning ourselves with. In terms of athletics, a meritocracy holds that a system that is designed to select for merit will tend to produce better athletes and hence better athleticism. In terms of the various crafts a system designed to select for merit will tend to produce better craftspeople, and hence better crafted goods, and so on. Within this theory we can already see certain limits associated with it, namely, that people as such are the drivers of any degree of betterment of the things in question. Likewise, there is a limit in terms of tools utilized to the creation of these goods and indeed these betterments. It's something of a truism that a craftsperson is only as good as their tools. We can of course create better tools, but this too has as its limit that of the craftspersons of the tools. A craftsperson of tools, after all, cannot create better tools than the craftsperson themselves are capable of creating. We could ponder the possibility of the tools themselves creating better tools, such is perhaps worth considering, however, the most obvious concern therein is do we thereby negate ourselves in the process of doing so. I saw an ad the other day, for example, that spoke of an AI that could write. As a writer, I could utilize that tool in order to write, but then, of course, I would no longer be a writer. At least insofar as I would have the AI do the writing. Perhaps, as I do here, I may utilize the AI as a writing tool whereby I still am the writer. Which begs the question, do we really want to make ourselves obsolete? We may very well hold that doing so is rather pointless to human life and may therefore pose itself as a limit regarding when are good enough solutions reached. That is, one answer to that question may very well be, in all pragmatics, assuming we want to bother continuing this species, good enough solutions are reached within a meritocracy if and when it is the case that we are no longer participating within the systems we create. 
Other kinds of answers to this question are entailed within the various limits a meritocracy implies, e.g. a good enough solution is reached when a system is about to produce excellent athletes, excellent craftspersons, and so on. Interestingly enough, those same kinds of concerns regarding automation of systems apply to every other field of human endeavor. Good enough solutions may be reached if slash when the craftsperson is no longer really capable of being a craftsperson. When, in other words, say, industrial processes take over the capacities of the craftsperson. This poses fairly fundamental questions regarding the nature of our species, meritocracy as a concept of worth, and what kind of value we are really speaking of when we speak of the value of life at all. We may envision, in other words, a society wherein the tools themselves create themselves, maintain themselves, and do little but service us, such that the species is essentially free from any labor that we do not want to do. There are fairly critical questions about such an envisioned society regarding pragmatics, costs associated with it, etc., such as are there even the raw materials to do so? Are there raw materials to do so in a sustainable manner? How much degradation to our planet would it cause? Would the degradation to our planet be so great that it becomes uninhabitable? These kinds of questions are rather disturbingly real in terms of concerns. There are other less tangible concerns worth considering, such as would the machines really serve us? What kind of horrors may a machine-like systemization really create of its own accord? There are better still questions to be asked, though, assuming that we were to manage to create such a place without the degradation of the planet in a sustainable manner, without the robot rebellion, and so forth, is that a life people would want to live? What would we even do in that instance? 1a. When a system produces pointless and absurd consequences, we may demarcate such as indicative of good enough solutions. Although I don't want to delve too deeply into this here, see the Amateur Philosophy website for such deeper delvings into the darker, more mysterious places of concern. I shall note that such constitutes the rather basic concerns regarding consistency of reality, that reality not be utterly absurd, or, insofar as it may be utterly absurd, we may prefer that there be demarcations within it whereby such absurdities do not hold sway. 2. Consequences of Meritocracy 2a. Iterative Violence 2a. I. Wherein whatever the field of consequent, the battle continues indefinitely. 2AII definition of system issues, that which occurs through iteration of a given system, but which is not necessarily apparent at any given iteration of the system. 2B. Few winners, many losers. 3. Relation to ecosystems. 3A. Detachment from the ecosystems. 3B. Non-local utilization of ecosystems. 3c. Degradation of existing fundamental systems of life. 3d. Movement of goods without cause. 4. Self-referential merit. 4a. Merit is determined by self-referential systems, e.g. people refer to merit as what they themselves determine as merit. Authority determines authority. 4b. Inherent cultural bias. What constitutes successful is relative to a given cultural modality of life. 4c. Dependence upon the modality of determination of success, most relevantly in the current economic success. 4c. I. Economic success is largely illusory in its form. Aims of wealth are already available without economic success attached, e.g. basic familial form living. 
for CII false attribution of value, e.g. manufactured value with little connectivity to the reality of lives, ethics, etc. For CIII performance of suffering as a norm. The pretense that there is some requirement to suffer before achievement. 5. Structural loss of familial form. Devotion to the meritocracy entails lack of devotion to the familial form as such. Considered at its basic root, time spent struggling for the supposed goods of wealth, success, etc., is time not spent within the reality of the familial form. 5a. Though not argued for here, I'd strongly invite folks to read in particular Plato's Republic to get at least a cursory sense of the role of a meritocracy and the entirety of Plato's works to get a strong sense of what is meant by a meritocracy and indeed of a republic. If folks are going to repudiate or defend these kinds of notions, it would be worthwhile that they are at least coming at it from a perspective of understanding regarding the foundational form of the position. 6. Modeling economics as that which occurs beyond the basics of life, rethinking what economics can do. 7. The question of labor. 7a. To what extent will people work beyond that which is required to produce the base goods and services available? 7b. To what extent will people's work be improved through competition? Moneyless Free Labor Societies As the title says this piece outlines the theory and pragmatics of a society that doesn't utilize money and instead utilizes free labor as a methodology for organizing societies and trade relations. Moneylessness is a fairly straightforward proposition. Money as a concept is just a tool, a very old tool that has likely lost its usefulness. This piece simply removes the tool of money from the existing societal systems and instead utilizes the metrics of freely chosen labor as the primary determining means by which goods and services are created, distributed, and utilized within a society. The theory holds that money as a motivating determination of what kinds of labor people do, while having some value, is not the best tool available for determining such things. That as a motivating tool it creates inequalities, incentivizes overproduction, scamming, thievery, violence and extractive practices that are neither sustainable nor desirable. Such moneyed incentives have enabled the species to develop the means to utilize resources in more productive and a greater variety of ways understood as development of new technologies, techniques, crafts and the various interbioregional systems of trade, all of which have in some meaningful ways improved the qualities of lives of the people who have benefited from them. These various developments have created the potential for the reduction of the overall labor people actually do in a society. This potential, however, is not being actualized. This piece argues that the principal reason for that is exactly the tool of money. In effect, people are caught up in the illusory power of money, wealth, greed, etc., forgetting that money is just a concept, a tool, and not a reality any more than the species so happen to make it a reality. The argument holds that all the relevant data regarding supply and demand to meet the needs wants, and desires of a given bioregion is already known. Astute readers may note that such was a principal aim of capitalistic theory, as in, let the people determine such things through free markets predicated upon the tool of money. Once that data is obtained, the tools of free markets predicated upon money are no longer useful for the tasks of creating and distributing the goods and services within and between societies. 
Moreover, the argument holds that by continuing to utilize the tool of money we are creating surplus labor, that is, labor that no one really wants to do and which isn't just useless, but is actively harmful on almost all levels. It wastefully creates goods and services that nobody wants, let alone needs. For instance, scams, thievery, and bad products, but also such things as pointlessly shipping goods and services around the globe, wherein those goods and services can be provided within any given bioregion, and the creation of masses of redundant, wasteful products that ultimately no one really wants, needs, or desires in general. The argument holds that a society predicated upon freely chosen labor can suss out all the surplus labor in the existing market, that absent the tool of money, while utilizing the relevant data regarding basic supply and demand, freely chosen labor is capable of doing the relevant labor of metrics of determination of such things itself. Free labor is a somewhat more complicated proposition than moneylessness. Labor is free in a few senses. It is freely chosen. There are few, if any, forced aspects involved in the labor that is done by people. This piece holds that money is a forcing mechanism whereby people are forced to work to live in the name of money rather than for necessity to achieve the needs wants and desires of a people. A free labor society holds that there are plausibly essential goods and services that people ought to perform the labor of in order to produce and distribute, but that laborers are more than capable and incentivized to take on those duties without any particular force, involved beyond the force of the ought itself, providing that they have the proper information. Moreover, freely chosen labor within the proper constraints provides exactly a mechanism whereby the kinds of labor that a society needs, wants, and desires can be determined. In essence, laborers understand that they have to work, can understand the plausible benefits and potential harms associated with any given type of labor, and hence that they themselves can determine through free choice in labor which labor they want to do. The rewards for doing said labor are free access to the goods and services so produced. Labor is also free in the sense that no one is getting paid for any kind of labor whatsoever. The argument holds that free labor, in the sense of not being paid via money, is thereby granted free access to all the available goods and services within a given bioregion and all adjacent bioregions. In essence, if no one is getting paid, if money as such is removed from the system in total, everyone within that system is thereby granted free access to all goods and services. This is tempered in a few ways. For one, labor is constrained to be primarily, but not exclusively, restricted in to whom they are trying to create the various goods and services for. Specifically this restriction is joint carved along the grounds of bioregions and ecosystems as a whole. This entails that labor done in any given bioregion is primarily, though not exclusively, Concerned with providing the relevant goods and services for that bioregion and all adjacent bioregions. Goods and services created therein that are in surplus of the needs, wants, and desires of the bioregions in question are gift given to non adjacent bioregions in an open gift giving trading market. The argument holds that the metric of freely chosen labor in much the same way as the invisible hand of the market within a capitalistic system does, will tend towards maximal production within each bioregion, provided that its aims are restricted as previously noted. In essence, labor is incentivized to do no more labor than is actually necessary to meet the needs, wants and desires within their own bioregion and all adjacent bioregions. 
At the same time, the species' capacity to produce has increased so dramatically that each bioregion is easily capable of producing far more than is required to meet the needs, wants, and desires of its bioregion and all adjacent bioregions. Far less labor, in other words, is required to do so, hence the massive glut of surplus labor in the current system previously alluded to. Such surpluses of goods and services are giftable to non-adjacent bioregions, that is, freely given. If no one wants them in any other bioregion, then what has been identified is a surplus of labor, which freely chosen labor abhors. Why work, after all, for something no one anywhere actually needs, wants, or desires? This piece details the pragmatics of the moneyless free labor society, addresses the real and silly concerns folks may have with it, presents the likely real benefits that come with it, and provides guidance as to probable methodologies for its implementation. It's a bit jargony, but the system as presented is neither communistic nor capitalistic in form nor for that matter is it particularly socialistic, anarchist, libertarian, authoritarian, oligarchical, or really any kind of organizational modeling that folks are likely familiar with. Its closest analog is the pragmatics of small town, rural, and village life in pre-modern times. Insofar as there are political concerns, the free labor society is democratic, but the system minimizes political concerns. It is a kind of synthesis of these various systems, one that is plausible especially via the bioregional joint carving, the removal of the tool of money, and the minimization of politics. The Free Labor Society draws on the strengths of these various organizational methodologies, places them within the constraints of the valid joint carving of bioregions and ecologies, utilizes the wisdoms and data associated with capitalistic free markets to meet the needs, wants and desires of people, the wisdoms of communism to trust in the actual people doing the relevant labor to be grown-ups bout it all, minimizes the involvement of political entities as such, and utilizes some significantly old-timey wisdoms regarding how actual people used to live before the rise of massive political entities tied with moneyed interests. A variety of methodologies for implementation are provided and examined. Potentially as simple as a head nodding of agreement by the existing political entities and oligarchical industries, creating relevant agreements between bioregionally constrained businesses and industries to implement such a system, to the more complex such as the plausible role of an open gift-giving market to actualize the system as a whole. A moneyless free labor society functionally operates on a few premises, each of which are argued for and expanded upon in this piece. 1. Money is a tool, nothing more. It has no intrinsic value to it. It is only as useful as it may be, as any other tool. Setting aside some old tool when a better one comes along is not a particularly bad thing, nor is it novel to do so for this species, though it is novelty. 2. People are kind, generous, and they want to help. Given the resources to do so, they will do so. 3. There is a superabundance in the world. In some sense, there always has been, but in the current that superabundance requires less labor than ever before, and the species' capacity to create a wide variety of products, goods, and services has radically changed. 4. The proper joint carving of societies as it relates to the production and utilization of goods and services is relative to the bioregion within which a given society lives. 5. 
The proper limits to production of anything are as they relate to the renewal rates of the given resource. 6. People will tend to do labor as a matter of choice. People do labor for a variety of reasons that are in and of themselves sufficient to meet the needs, wants, and desires of people. There are few, if any, needs for someone other than laborers themselves to force labor to do the necessary work to meet the needs, wants, and desires of a people. 7. Money as a tool creates serious issues in any society that utilizes it. It has limitations to its effectiveness and undesirable consequences to its use. Among the most significant issues thereof is that money as a tool distorts the labor market, motivating people to do undesirable things, creating unwanted or needed products and labors. 8. Minimization of political institutions and institutions of economic control is a general good, as these kinds of organizations tend to skew free labor production towards distorted ends that are undesirable. 9. Freely chosen labor will tend towards efficient, high-quality productions of goods and services, as labor generally abhors useless labor and laborers tend to enjoy high-quality goods and services. 10. As local as possible. The principle holds that short supply lines are in all cases preferable, as they minimize the use of resources and create the conditions whereby each bioregion is capable of being as self-sustaining as possible. This principle does not entail an absolute prohibition against longer supply lines. It simply provides the delimited structure whereby any longer supply lines ought to be constructed, e.g. as local as possible. See the maps provided in the description. Maps of true communities of interests, neutral in their formation, definitionally sound in their economic structure, blind as to the metrics of race, class, gender, religion, etc. Note the size of bioregions amounts to what this species would generally refer to as countries. Hence when speaking of bioregions and all adjacent bioregions, we are speaking of rather large areas. Thus the high probability that they can generally meet all the needs, wants and desires of any given bioregion, especially in the current wherein all the relevant seeds of crop production are generally available for everyone, and where they are not, they are easy enough to just give them to people and provide the proper training on their use. Note that there are smaller ecological joints within bioregions which are worthwhile in consideration on a practical scale. Such can be understood as it relates to this piece as the imperative to have short supply lines, as local as is possible as a principle. Such more detailed maps exist, but I don't think are particularly relevant for the discussion here. Such localized aspects are pragmatic applications, when references in this piece to something being idiosyncratic to a given bioregion, such is indicative of the more nuanced realities that exist within any given bioregion. Hence, referring to these more detailed smaller or in some cases larger ecological joint carvings. In the map used here, such smaller divisions are ecoregions. Another relevant smaller division is watersheds. The map used here also offers larger divisions as biorealms, which are certainly useful in consideration of very broad scalar concerns regarding overall climate change effects, etc. Like with the smaller divisions such as relevant in terms of nuance on specific norms of action, but are too idiosyncratic to really be presented in this piece. Notable, however, that such are at least in part what is under consideration when speaking of interbioregional trade, 
and utilization of resources that are not equitably distributed or distributable. Moreover, due to the way that this piece tends to diminish the relevance of politics, political borders, etc., in favor of a well-constrained trade systemization, these kinds of nuance are not appropriate to the piece. When speaking of renewal rates of various resources, it is exactly this kind of nuance to the issues that is largely being spoken of, e.g. how are watersheds, ecoregions, bioregions and biorealms affected by the utilization of the various resources. In other words, as the piece delimits the importance of overarching political concerns, there are no political solutions that determine in broad strokes how an economic is structured. Preferring instead to hold to the sound joint carved ecological principles as the delimiting factor, and the hands of labor as the directive mechanism of determination. When speaking of joint carving, although this doesn't exhaust the term as it is used in philosophy, the philosophical notion of joint carving is exactly the meaning the piece is referring to with that term. Without getting too deep into the philosophy of it, the notion of joint carving is, what are the proper conceptual cuts to make in order to understand the world in a meaningful and effective manner? In the classic formulation, the notion is when butchering an animal and carving it up into portions, one does best by cutting at the joints. Among the foundational claims of this piece is that by joint carving along bioregional grounds, the rationale for political systemizations is minimized and the rationale for moneyed systemizations is eliminated. A properly joint carved division of the land along its bioregional structure entails the capacity to forego political concerns of control over a land or control over a people, at least for the most part. At the same time the boundaries so carved serve as sound structures for the utilization of the resources and trade between bioregions. The latter point deserves a bit of explanation. A bioregion is definitionally ecologically sound. While there may be some fiddling with the exact borders, and while it is the case that those borders are inherently porously defined and dependent upon that porosity for their structural integrity, nonetheless they define an ecologically sound system that is largely self-sustaining. The hedging therein having everything to do with the porosity of the border, specifically as it relates to adjacent bioregions who are thereby reflexively defined in the same manner and as it relates to scalarly different ecological regions that are similarly defined. Despite all these caveats, there is real sensicalness and pragmatics in holding to the position that a bioregion is ecologically sound. Its ecological soundness is exactly defined by the transference of, perhaps ultimately, energy, but a bit less vaguely understood, the transference of life forms and resources within and across its porous borders. This point is critical for the reader to grasp at, for it is exactly that kind of transference of living and non-living things that constitutes a real economy. The argument, therefore, is very straightforward, the real economy is the transference of living and non-living things. A bioregionally bound ecology soundly transfers living and non-living things. Therefore, the bioregional structure is a sound real economic structure. What the species refers to when it refers to the economic, wittingly or not, is exactly the movement of these kinds of real entities. In the economic, the species is primarily though not exclusively, referring to the species' laborious actions that do exactly the transference of these kinds of entities. In other words, the economic as it is commonly understood is referring to the human species' ecologically bound labors, and nothing else. The house of the species' movements matter, 
what tools, methods, techniques, etc. they use make a difference in the pragmatics. But ultimately the economic in real terms refers specifically to the aforementioned labors of the species. If folks speak of the movements of money, of the economics of some specific industry, they are referring to a particular subset of the aforementioned economic structure of the human species. In the case of money, they are speaking of the movement of the symbols of money, the movements of the tools of money, not the movements of the real economic structures. In an extremely important sense, they are talking about the movement of imaginary constructs that don't have any relation to the real economic beyond whatever imaginative favor we grant them. In a slightly less important but still fairly critical sense to grasp at, they are speaking nonsense in total when they speak of the economics of money fully detached from reality, they are essentially speaking of such things that are exactly as important and trivial as video game economies. This point is expanded upon and utilized a great deal later in this piece. In the case of some specific industry, they are speaking of the movement of the goods and services that specific industry provides and nothing else. Such constitutes a valid human interfaced aspect of the real economy. Fairly importantly to grasp at, such movements of the human species are clearly not bioregionally bound in any strong sense of that term. That is, the human species has the capacity, and indeed very oft the desire, to transgress the bioregional bounds of whatever scalar. This sort of freedom of movement without regard to the underpinning ecology within and through which such movements occur is, this piece holds, the central issue of the species' economic and ecological woes. In essence, the unrestrained movement has deleterious effects upon the ecologies. They are definitionally not ecologically sound. To strike a chord with the more conservative and slash or religiously minded crowd, the underpinning ecologies are by divine design. The species has the capacity to move within and through them, to fiddle with them, play with them, and indeed, perhaps even make more of them than was there before, but doing so carries with it significant burdens, hurdles, hassles, dangers, etc. The point being that basing the human economical, really ecological, movements within the bioregionally bound structures in a constrained, but not thereby utterly limited manner, can be understood from a very fundamentalist, conservative standpoint as being basing broad human behavior within the divine structures in a respectful manner. Though, this is not a line of argument this piece tends to utilize, I place it up front nonetheless so that such folks can have a sound means of framing the kinds of considerations, argumentations, and positions that the piece does make. Money is a tool, nothing more or less. Money is a tool intended to provide a means for the distribution of goods and services within a society. All goods and services, however, are actually labor. Money, in other words, is an overlay of the actual economy. At best it measures, directs, and distributes the labor that actually creates and distributes all the goods and services of a society. What follows is a plausible hypothetical and various arguments for the creation of a society that is not dependent upon the tool of money. This piece will provide a guide or map firstly for the pragmatics of such a labor-based society and secondarily for plausible methodologies for its implementation within the world we are currently living in. The principal claim, while undoubtedly controversial, is rather straightforward, so much so that an astute reader could likely derive much of what follows in this piece from the preceding paragraphs, as short as they are, p. 
people will work for the rewards of their labor, not just individually, but also collectively. Among the difficulties involved in organizing a society is how to distribute the goods that one person creates, that another does not. In the reductive case there is a solution that largely presents itself, and which ought to be understood as the principal solution that has been utilized throughout the overwhelming majority of the species history rough familial sufficiency. That is, if everyone in a family has the capacity to produce all the goods that they need to survive and indeed thrive, then there isn't really much of a need for the trading of goods and services with others. Understanding that generally historically this has entailed subsistence farming as a way of life, and even within that modality of living, trading between farmers was common enough. Such was more of a bartering than a trading via the medium of monies, but nonetheless, the principle, theory and practice is fairly sound, as is demonstrable through the overwhelming majority of the species' history. This historical point is worth expanding on in generalized terms, as in the current that sort of reality has largely been forgotten or obscured via the modern reality within which we are living. Most people, throughout most of history, did not utilize money at all, or at the least, not as their primary modality of trade. In all cultures, most people throughout history lived in small villages, wherein there was not a meaningful moneyed aspect in terms of how basic needs, wants, and desires were met. More pointedly, the overwhelming majority of people lived in a rural setting, not an urban setting. Money as a modality of trade was largely utilized by urban dwellers, as the urban setting doesn't by itself tend to provide the needs, wants, and desires of the people living therein. In other words, the baker can't bake the bread predicated upon the land the city is on. Nor again can any of the people within a city live predicated upon the land the city is on. Hence, city dwellers utilize the mechanism of trade, taxes, governments, etc., to draw the resources from the rural areas in order to provide for the people in the cities. In short, they develop the tool of money as a modality of trade in order to move resources around. In the rural areas, this kind of trade simply wasn't necessary. While the exact details vary in time, culture, and place, in general the rural dwellers communally produced foods and gifted them to each other within the villages they lived. They tended to make their own goods and services rather than trading with anyone, especially anyone outside the village they lived. It is important to note that such systems didn't generally functionally operate via a government structure controlling the situation. While it is true that governmental structures existed, by and large the actual day-to-day, week-to-week, season-to-season, year-to-year labor involved was not determined by the local government structures. Historically speaking, the local lords and ladies, or the local representative of the larger scalar governmental body was broadly tasked with distributing the locally produced goods to the cities, in essence, as the cities couldn't produce such goods themselves. They of course served other purposes, but in terms of economics such was essentially their role. It's a bit of a side trek. But such is important to understand in order to avoid the real horrors involved with large-scale government control and disassociate what is being described here from notions of communistic theory, the latter largely being predicated upon larger-scalar systems of control. Though both communistic theory and a moneyless free labor society do draw upon the same reality regarding rural life. Such is a bit of an oversimplification, but it highlights the point that money is just a tool. 
It is an agreement between people towards some specific end, nothing more and nothing less. The reader ought not interpret this point as necessarily indicative of there being an inherent problem with money in the sense of cities sucking rural areas dry. Though it is important to note historically that such concerns were real and common prior to World War II and underpin many of the current political divides between rural dwellers and city dwellers. Still, we may very well hold that we don't all want to be farmers, and there are obvious pitfalls involved with such a modality of living. It is materially poor, for instance, takes up the majority of people's lives to accomplish, and as each familial unit is essentially fated to the field, the prospects of creating goods and services that are not of the field are extremely limited. There are, after all, goods and services that are not directly or even indirectly related to the field that societies view as a good, and sometimes a great good. To be blunt, folks cannot create specialized goods and services if all the species are more or less fated to the fields. I don't mean such as any kind of disrespect to those who work the fields, beyond the mereness of its necessity as a matter of life, or at least as a matter of this life, the life so lived is not something of poor quality. I mean such far more in the materiality and spirituality of the quality of lives that folks can live as a society. Among the things to understand from this short section is that there are no obvious or unobvious reasons as to why a people cannot do the same kind of thing as it relates to broader structures than plain familial self-sufficiency. In other words, people can, and generally have for the overwhelming majority of the species' history functionally operated as a community, predicated not upon money, but upon gift-giving. That the gifts may have changed, grown more generous even, is no reason to suggest that the same cannot be done. Farmers used to and to a meaningful extent still do trade the various products of their fields with each other so that folks get a better variety than just whatever they so happen to grow. Indeed, they often simply give them away without any sense of trading involved. Just a simple understanding that others will do the same. In a meaningful sense this piece is holding that there are no reasons why any other industry cannot do exactly the same kind of thing. Those who make clothes give them away, those that make bread give them away, those that make tools give them away, and so forth. Note, though largely left unspoken in this piece, the disposition, that is, the attitude to not do so is one that is primarily predicated upon fear, loathing of others, concern of being, taken advantage of, concern of others, not doing their fair share, and so forth. The relevant ethical, emotive, and reasonable upshot thereof being that such concerns are merely concerns, significantly that such are lacking in the reality of how people actually behave. Much of the point of pointing out the historical realities of people's day-to-day, month-to-month, season-to-season, year-to-year lives, is exactly to note that human behavior is not actually the kind of depraved, hedonistic, self-centered, horror show that moneyed society makes it out to be. Humanity may make a picture of themselves upon the silvery screen to display themselves to each other, but such displays are secondary to the reality, always up close yet such up closeness may not be the relevant perspective of the reality. There are reasons for understanding the proper framework within which gift-giving can realistically and functionally operate, and there are reasons to examine the pragmatics of exactly how that can be accomplished beyond the basic small-town gift-giving mechanisms. The point again is to highlight that such practices are and always have been normal, and ought not be viewed as anything particularly radical.
The reader would do well to recognize and keep in mind that money is just a kind of agreement between people, a substitute for formal agreements such as bartering or informal agreements such as communally producing and sharing or social arrangements. Money is a kind of abstraction of agreements. In the free-form modality of its use that is capitalism, the reader ought to therefore recognize that people will agree to work for the abstraction of agreements. People do not, in other words, actually require the symbology of money to make agreements to work. To try and be clear on that point, if people will work for the abstraction of agreements as represented by money, then they will also be willing to work for the abstraction of agreements, without necessarily relying upon the representation of those abstractions of agreements. There is a concern regarding if people can trust each other enough to actually do the work they agree to in abstraction. In some sense, and an important sense, this feeling is something that motivates the utilization of money. Such amounts to a kind of social arrangement, whereby the social arrangement is rather simply put, freely chosen labor in exchange for access to all goods and services provided by everyone's freely chosen labor. Again, recognizing that the disposition to not trust, the concern that folks won't do, is a feeling and only a feeling, is something that the reader can utilize and disregard as something that isn't a valid reason to not trust. Another aspect the reader would do well to take away from this section is to recognize that by making agreements in abstraction, the species is able to produce a far wider variety of goods and services. Innovation is not, in other words, spurred on through money as such, rather, Innovation is spurred on through trust in abstract agreements to work together on things. Trust enough that someone's willing to try something new, specifically, something that doesn't in and of itself produce the necessary goods and services to live, i.e. basically farming, nonetheless enables the production of goods and services that people in general would want and desire and in a very meaningful sense, grow to need. In other words, the creative capacity to develop different modalities of life aside from subsistence farming. Again, no dig on the farmers. After all, moneyless free labor societies is arguing that the actual traditional modality of trade, that of farmers, Rural living is not only applicable but by far a good in comparison to the utilization of money and, bluntly speaking, farmers produce a great deal of what the species needs to meet everyone's needs, wants, and desires. Though it will be expanded upon later in this piece, another introductory point for the reader to have in mind is the sheer abundance that the species has at its fingertips. The amount of labor involved to produce en masse goods and services is wildly different than at any point in the species' history. So much so that it is fairly inappropriate to hold to a position that is emotionally predicated upon fears of folks not doing their fair share when their fair share of labor towards the community is actually rather minimal. While this, of course, and importantly, isn't the case everywhere in the globe, the capacity for it to exactly be everywhere in the globe is real. More than the reduction in the amount of labor involved, the abundance associated with the capacity to produce is so great that the very fundamental structures of the ecology broadly, and as they relate to the ecologies of the species, has changed. The economics and ecological of scarcity is simply not the same as the economics and ecological of abundance. For a moneyless society to properly function, local economics are the focus. Where local is a relativized phrase attaching its locality to the relevant systems of production. 
people are most inclined to hold that local only entails the life of the small town, however, local could and often does entail a locale that is broader, oft far broader than any town or even mega city. Local is understood as the interconnected relations that comprise a given locale. This is most easily relatable to ecologies, wherein the locale is defined by the systemic structure that operates cohesively as a whole, even as it is embedded within structures that comprise larger or smaller locales. In terms of economics, ignoring the artifice of political borders, because all economics is ultimately predicated upon the production of foods, crops, and materials, a given local moniker ought and is best understood as being synonymous with the bioregion within which the people are living. Hence, local is a technical term understandable as that which maps onto the ecology of a bioregion. This situates the people and hence the economy within a well-defined structure. Larger scalar ecological structures are still potentially relevant, but this joint carving of the economics has as its principle cut the local bioregional expression, within which people are in essence integral parts thereof. As will be expanded upon later, in pragmatics a given bioregional locale, is typically and perhaps even always actually defined in conjunction with its adjacent bioregions. Hence in pragmatics the relevant scalar unit for local economies is understood as a bioregion and all its adjacent bioregions. Though such is best ultimately defined by the relevant sciences, for our purposes we can largely understand this as the local watershed and bioregion as a whole. The watershed defines one axis of the practical limits of the economic to functionally operate, to borrow a phrase, water is life in some very pragmatic sense. The bioregion as a whole is not necessarily so limited to the watershed. For instance, the geology in particular can play a meaningful role in an economy wherein the various products of the earth that are not dependent upon water are produced. Likewise, the sea as such is not generally defined as a meaningful part of the watershed in that it doesn't play a meaningful role as such within the local water processes. Or more pointedly, the sea as such is generally only partially attached to the local water processes of any given bioregion. Though such concerns are not relevant for this basic joint carving of the bioregions, it is useful for the reader to have some grasp of the basic ecological realities that are to be discussed throughout this piece. There is a bit of vagueness within the definition but such nonetheless provides a good method for the reader to have a conceptualization of what this piece is referring to when referring to local economies. There are larger and smaller scalarly relevant economies of note, as just as within ecologies these various local economies interact in various ways. However, until we get a handle upon the primary joint carving of the economic, the local bioregional economy, we won't delve into these other scalarly relevant economies. Why would anyone work for no money? The essence of the answer to that is for access to all the local goods and services available. The principal claim for the local economy is that its products, are freely available to the local populace in virtue of the labor they provide, regardless of what labor they are providing. The underpinning economic principle is that if it costs no money to produce some good or service, then it also costs no money to utilize said good or service. Its costs are in labor, not money. Perhaps more pointedly, the agreements between people actually underpin the labor and nothing more. For folks steeped in the lore of money, such likely will sound like an outlandish kind of claim. 
However, the soundingness is far more a result of their failure to break free from the imaginative bonds their lore holds upon them than anything of serious concern. Such isn't really that much different than why it is that anyone works within the current economic system. They work for money, which gives them free access primarily to the local goods and services available, insofar as the money is capable of providing them access. Money is just a tool, in a meaningful sense, a measurement tool, though it has had, and perhaps may have had, additional uses. What it supposedly measures is the value of the labor someone is doing, thereby granting them a portion or share of the local goods and services available within society, predicated exactly upon the value of the labor they produce. That notion, however, is fairly far-flungly flawed. The supposition that money actually measures the value of labor in a meaningful sense is inverse to its functional role in society. It is, in other words, a bad tool of measurement for such things. Within a moneyless society, we are simply removing the tool and holding to an ethical principle that everyone in a society deserves more or less equal access to the goods and services available within the local economy. In that context it is worth noting that within a moneyed society they are also trying to hold to an ethical principle, recalling that money has no intrinsic value. The point of mentioning this, as will come up oft in this piece, is that the notion of holding to an ethical principle is not outlandish, radical, etc., and as it is done in the current systemization, it cannot be used as a rationale or justification as to why not to do a moneyless free labor society. The readers ought note that in abstraction and in practice, when the tool of money is removed, the real value of the economic comes to the fore. The production and distribution of goods and services, the labors involved thereof, the meeting of supply with demand, are all plausible measures of value that don't actually have anything whatsoever to do with money as such, but are what money as such is supposed to measure. That money does so oh so poorly is of relevance for the various social and economic ills the species faces as will be expanded upon a fair amount later in this piece the utilization of the new tools of big data big computer and the extensive lore within the various industries that the species has is simply accomplishing the same tasks that money was set to only better and without the extraneous hardships associated with the use of the tool of money this piece holds that such freedom and liberty of access is at least at first pass merely towards that available within the local economy, because that is exactly where the labor is primarily done, and that is where the goods and services are primarily available. Such clearly will run into different kinds of challenges within a relativized non-local economy, the aforementioned larger and smaller scalarly relevant economies, again, before we delve into those folks need to firstly get a handle on the local economies. Such will also tend to run into real issues and concerns on a local level, these shall be addressed a bit later in this piece. To try and be clear what freedom and liberty of access actually entails within a local economy, I shall be fairly blunt about many of the pragmatics involved. When a local laborer goes to the local grocery store, they simply pick up the foods and supplies they need, want and desire for the household with exactly no exchange of monies taking place. When people go to a local show, there is no admission price, they simply go. When they go to the local furniture maker, they simply select the kind of furniture they want. When they go to the local bar, they simply order the drinks they want. When they go to the local restaurant, they simply order the food that they want. In all cases, there is exactly no exchange of monies taking place. 
What is being exchanged is labor within the local economy. Why does the furniture maker bother to make furniture at all? Because the furniture maker, like everyone else in the local economy, is being given free access to all the goods and services available within the local economy. Again, to be blunt about it, the furniture maker makes the furniture because by doing that labor they are thereby granted access to the labors of the seamstresses and tailors, the labors of the farmers, the labors of brewers and distillers, in sum, they are thereby granted access to the labors of everyone within the local economy, and not necessarily for any other reason. There are, however, other reasons that anyone within the local economy may choose to do the labors they do. Prestige, accolades, passion, fun, boredom, and necessity are all good reasons people within a local economy may choose to do any given labor. Call such rewards working for doof. Working for doof amounts to the abstraction of agreements that is already in place within a moneyed society, after the removal of the symbology involved. I want to touch upon a particular motive that speaks to the point far beyond those of typical concern of the economists. Namely, the motive to work for family, for community, and not really for any other particular reason. To work for doof is to work with the understanding that by doing so we are thereby providing well for everyone within the community, and on a somewhat more personal level, we are thereby providing well for our families. Again, we may speak of motivations that are pertinent to the individual in terms of what specific kinds of labor they may do, and those concerns do matter in terms of determinations of how and what labors are done in particular. But in terms of why anyone would work at all, that is, why would anyone work for no money, their primary and indeed likely most powerful, pertinent and salient motivation is that by doing so one provides well for one's family, and a bit more broadly, for one's community. Understanding that by contributing to broader scalar, really fractal scalar forms, such as community, bioregional, interbioregional, and global scalars, those larger scalar entities in turn better take care of the smaller scalar forms. A well-running community, to be a bit blunt about it, provides far better than an individual's basic concerns for their self, or for that matter, than what a given family can provide for themselves alone. Such is hardly a particularly novel take or understanding, and yet, such is so fundamental a component to the motivational factors involved in why and how people would choose to work that it underpins the economic, the social, the cultural well-being of a community. It is certainly sufficient to the task of the dubious ask in this little section, why would anyone work for free? Are you even serious? Is the suggestion seriously that working for doof is not sufficient for someone? What other kind of motivation are such folks suggesting they or anyone else needs? Are there people whom look upon the reality, the information available, the basic reasoning, of maximally providing for the well-being of their families, indeed, for themselves, and wonder, well sure, but what do I get out of it? What you say?